Hello, everyone, and welcome to Wildlife Wednesdays. Thank you for tuning in. We're streaming to you live on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. And I'm Victoria Neville, a Senior Specialist of Ecosystem Restoration here at WWF Canada. And I'm here to introduce our species expert on sea turtles today. And that is going to be Chelsea Bowler. Now, Chelsea Bowler is a specialist of conservation and fisheries at WWF Canada. And we go way back for three or four years. We've been working on restoration projects, working directly with, well, this is us working in a stream with beaver and salmon. We've also worked on capelin for many, many years. She's definitely saved my, my butt a ton of times. That's us snorkeling in a river. I'm so excited because she's now on our wildlife and industry team and she has a great new portfolio working on sea turtles and I have no idea anything about it. So I'm here to interview her so that we can learn all about it. So take it away, Chelsea. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Victoria, for that awesome, hey, awesome welcome. I love those photos of us. I wish we were out in the field still. It's the best part of the job for sure. I miss um, just, you. I miss you too. <laughs> <laughs> just a little bit more um, about me. I grew up in the prairies and um, for some reason had this infatuation with the ocean for so long. And I moved out uh, to the east coast of Canada about 14 years ago. And I'm currently on the west coast of Newfoundland, where I've been for the last seven years. And as Victoria mentioned, I am on the wildlife and industry team, which means that I typically work with fishers and unions, community and indigenous groups. And as my title suggests, these projects are usually related to conservation and restoration in some way. And um, Victoria already gave a great snapshot of some of the things that we've worked on together. But I am super excited to be here and talk to you guys about sea turtles. Oh, I'm excited to have you here today. Awesome. So I am going to be chatting with you guys about sea turtles, but really specifically about um, leatherbacks. And I just wanted to give you a little insight into what leatherbacks look like. You're going to see some awesome footage coming up on this screen. But uh, the leatherback turtle can be found both on the Atlantic and the Pacific coasts of Canada. And uh, it was designated as two separate subpopulations in 2012, where the Atlantic leatherback unfortunately is recognized as an endangered species now oh, because wow. yeah and so th they were kind of grouped together as a one in uh, 1981 but in more recent years they've been split up and because leatherbacks have such a large distribution range there's a lot of different threats that impact them at various stages of their life cycle oh my gosh Chelsea they're so cute and <laughs> I didn't I, I've used to seeing those images down in the tropics. I didn't realize that they actually came up to our waters. So you mentioned they're endangered. Um, can you talk a little bit about why? Yeah, definitely. There's a bunch of different threats that are that they're facing. Um, a couple of them, just to give you guys a little bit of insight. The first one is climate change, which I know is kind of this like big overarching term that we hear a lot. But the reason that climate change impacts sea turtles specifically is that it influences the beach dynamics. Um, so you have like sea level rise, for example, that can interact with beaches in a different way. And then with sexing of sea turtles. So when um, the females go and lay their eggs, Eggs, the warmer the beach is, the more females that you will have in, in that clutch of eggs. And then the cooler the beach is, the more males that you'll have. And so when we have climate change and we have warmer temperatures, you're going to see a lot more females on the beach. Well, that sounds like a good thing. As, well, <laughs> in some ways it could be a good thing, but we still need those male counterparts to show up every once in a while. Um, and beaches are really, really important, um, of course, for, for sea turtles. And besides climate change and sea level rise, there's other things that can impact our beaches, like with infrastructure, if we have kind of this hardening of the shorelines with buildings or armor stone. And then usually when we have kind of these developed shorelines, we have more people that are in the region and so you can have increased instances of egg poaching you typically have a lot more lights as well and sea turtles like to lay their eggs at night and so with a lot of light pollution um, sometimes the female turtles won't even come ashore to lay eggs they will just return to sea without laying their clutch 
Okay, well, that's really interesting. It kind of connects with some of our work here um, based in Newfoundland and the Atlantic provinces and in Labrador on, on Capelin who need those beach habitats as well. And, um, you know, we often don't think about them as important habitat for fish, but apparently turtles and other places as well. And then you mentioned the light pollution, which we see sometimes affects our Atlantic puffins. So connections left, right and center. Yeah. Absolutely. And the threats that kind of, um, I guess, impact the sea turtles more in our distribution up around the Atlantic um, is really a lot of plastic pollution and interactions with the fishery. Um, and so those can be from a lot of different areas and in a lot of different ways that I'm sure we'll get into when we get into some of the specific questions. Okay, awesome. Okay, so we've already gone to endangered threats, uh, kind of deep stuff. Uh, do you think, though, for those of us and the kids and everybody online, we can just talk about turtles in general and what types we've got and things like that? Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to. So sea turtles are super, super cool. They are as old as the dinosaurs. And the first turtle, the first sea turtle, um, lived about 120 million years ago, which is a little bit bonkers if you think about it. And when you Google like for fossils of these first um, turtles, they really look so similar to what we are used to seeing in our waters today. So that's pretty, pretty neat. And there are seven sea turtles across the globe. Um, unfortunately, all of them are threatened to some degree, whether they're listed officially or not. And we have four of these turtles here in Canada. Okay, so we do have them here in Canada. Um, so four of them, but to me, like a turtle is a turtle is kind of a turtle. Um, <laughs> what are the four species? Uh, how can we tell them apart? Do you have any idea? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. There's um, there. Yeah. So let's go through the four and then I'll give you just like a few fun facts about each of them. And um, and you can let me know if you have any more questions. So the Kemp's Ridley is the first one um, that I'll talk about. And I actually don't know too, too much about this particular one. I know that they're found mostly in the Guelph of Mexico, but they can be found as far up as Nova Scotia. So if you are in the Nova Scotia region, you might see these guys. You can see they have like a pretty definitive ridge across the, the center part of their shell there. And um, the one that I'm sure most people are aware of or have seen is the green turtle. So green turtles actually live all over the world and can be found off the coast of more than 140 countries. And it is the second largest sea turtle next to the leatherback. So usually um, when we think of sea turtles, this is typically the one that pops into most people's minds. Uh, we have loggerhead turtles here in Canada as well. Now loggerheads are also listed as endangered alongside the leatherbacks. They were listed a little um, later in 2017. And the reason they have this loggerhead um, title to them is because they have really broad muscular heads and blunt jaws. And that really allows them to feed on hard shell prey like different mollusks and snails and all that kind of stuff. Wow. Yeah, so it's pretty neat because it's quite different from what the leatherbacks feed on. Um, so leatherbacks actually feed on jellyfish and leatherbacks are the largest sea turtle. They can reach up to eight feet and over 2000 pounds and they're distinct in their look. You can kind of see their shells are a lot different. They're shaped differently. So they have this teardrop shape and they have these ridges that go along their back. There's actually seven ridges that kind of go along the back of their shells and reach down to their tails. And so they're pretty distinct and they have this really dark coloring to them compared to some of the other sea turtles that we just saw. Wow, they're huge. And I can't yeah. believe they you can tell they're old. They really have that prehistoric look uh, uh, to them. Do. I can't yeah. imagine just like, you know, seeing them in our waters. I've spent some time, you know, on fishing boats and research surveys, but I've never seen them. I guess I haven't spent enough time. But um, so we see them in Canada. Can you talk about, you know, when or how they get up here and when and so when I might get to see one if I want to go on a boat tour or something like that? Yeah, for sure. So most sea turtles travel a really long distance, about 18,000 kilometers, which is so bonkers. I, if I was in the ocean trying to travel that distance, I would get lost even if I had a GPS system with me. But turtles have kind of this built in GPS system, which is really cool. So the sea turtles, when they're traveling these long distances, they actually use the magnetic fields in the earth that they can tap into with these magnetic minerals that they have in their brain, which is really, really cool. And and um, yeah, so they, they use those magnetic fields to travel um, from their nesting grounds around South America region and these subtropical, tropical waters. And then they come
come up our coastline to feed and leatherbacks are feeding on jellyfish. And we actually have um, a lot of leatherback turtles in our Atlantic waters um, between the months of usually June and November because we have this really predictable um, there was this really predictable density, I guess, of jellyfish. And that's what they really like to feed on. Oh, yes. The jellyfish. I have seen the jellyfish. Definitely seen them. Avoided them for sure. But uh, <laughs> wow. What do we call them? I don't even remember what our species of jellyfish are, but I remember how they feel. Yeah, um, me too. It's not fun. <laughs> <laughs> but okay. Let's take it back to the cute cutes. I saw some really adorable images of little leatherbacks, like Finding Nemo style. Um, can you tell us a little bit about them when they're starting off their life uh, on the beaches? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, leatherbacks lay their eggs on beaches, as we've said multiple times <laughs> in this um, discussion. And what the females do, they actually come um, they come ashore so long as it is nice and dark for them. And they will flick the sand back uh, using their flippers and they'll lay clutches of eggs. So that's what they call kind of this grouping of eggs. You can see it on the screen there now. And um, like I said, they usually lay at night and there's upwards of 115 eggs in each clutch. Now, only 85% of these eggs actually survive survive to make it to hatch and hatching takes about 55 to 60 days after the females have actually laid their eggs um, and then the little turtles emerge from the eggs like you said Victoria they're like really cute looking <laughs> and they head to sea um, hopefully they don't get picked off by predators along the way and once they get to the waters they actually follow the currents to nursery grounds where they feed and then like another ridiculous statistic is that only six of them actually or sorry six percent of them actually make it to adulthood um so really that point from hatching and then to year one um is really a, a very critical time for little sea turtles wow okay so not a lot of them are getting out there and they're endangered so um i'd like to switch it back to kind of what you're working on and talk a little bit about ocean plastics and you know that threat and you know how we can kind of mitigate it and stop it from impacting sea turtles so much yeah absolutely so the um when we talk about plastics i think a lot of people think about like the single-use plastics um yeah. plastic bags and stuff like that which is you know those are things that impact sea turtles um especially the the bags you can see there you can imagine it might look like a jellyfish to a leatherback that's swimming around our oceans um so sometimes they will they will ingest the plastic that they find in the ocean um at, because they think it's food and that can really uh block up their their guts and they're not able to digest this plastic the same way they would a jellyfish of course and that can cause some major issues um, for the turtles and then the other besides if we're thinking if we're moving away from kind of single-use plastics over to industry sometimes sea turtles can um, interact with fisheries and that could either be active fishing gear that um, folks are actively fishing and they come and they have a turtle entangled and they can disentangle the turtle that's like best case scenario because no fisher actually wants to catch a turtle um, no. and then in other instances sometimes we have um, lost fishing gear um, so lost fishing gear is sometimes referred to as ghost gear I I don't know if you've ever heard that term before. I've um, heard you say it and it doesn't sound good. No, it sounds a little bit spooky. So ghost <laughs> gear is actually um, gear that's been lost at sea for some reason or another. A lot of the times it's due to bad weather, um, for example, and traps or netting can get lost. Um, and basically what this is doing is it's passively fishing on the bottom of the ocean or not necessarily on the bottom. It could be pelagic as well, depending on the type of gear. And it's not only detrimental to sea turtles, but it can catch other species of fish and mammals um, and the worst part about it is like I said with an active fishery the fisherman is usually there to disentangle um, to you know get help for the animal if needed to report these to the necessary authorities but with this passive gear we're not sure exactly where this gear is um, and of course if, when we don't know where it is we don't know how to help the animals that get entangled into it. Oh, that is not good news. Um, so obviously our viewers out there care. Um, and so they're going to want to hear what specifically here, are those of us in Canada at our computers now, what can we do to help protect these endangered sea turtles? Yeah, I think that one of the biggest things that we can do is really look at our own behaviors and our own waste management. So when we're thinking about that single use plastic, for example, maybe um, not opting for plastic bags. I know that um, plastic bags are becoming kind of non-existent in a lot of regions, which is fantastic. So just being mindful of what we're using um, 
in the plastic realm and how we're actually disposing of that. And then if we're talking about industry or thinking about like the fishing industry, so if you or anyone you know works within the fishing industry, just spreading awareness and information is super helpful and connecting fishers to the right tools to stay safe if they do ever encounter a sea turtle. Um, and then the threats to nesting beaches. So when we're thinking about nesting beaches, um, those are typically, well, they're not typically, they're not in Canada, okay, mm -hmm. they're further south, but there are tons of organizations um, that do a lot of work with the nesting sites for leatherbacks and other sea turtles. So you can definitely connect with those organizations and donate your time. Oh, wow. Okay, so that's really cool. I'm hoping that when uh, travel bans are lifted, I get a chance to do some volunteering for some of these beaches but now I know what I can do at home in my bubble and and go clean up some beaches so um I'm just checking I haven't been monitoring the chat there are some folks here it's about question and answer time and I think first we're going to go to a video question awesome awesome so let's take a look here I love getting the video ones in yeah. Okay. Well, we can take a look and see if there's any questions in there while we wait for the video. Why do sea turtles have cells on their back? Because they have the hide. So sweet. <laughs> yeah. So okay. Sweet. Yeah. Um. So when we think about um turtles in general, I think we usually think about them like retreating into their shells if something is attacking them or if they get scared or whatever it is. And really what the um, what the shell is, if we think about our spine and our rib cage, it's basically what a shell is to a turtle. Um, so it protects all their soft kind of inner parts. Um, but unfortunately, sea turtles can't actually retreat into their shells the same way that land turtles and tortoises can. So this does make them a little bit more vulnerable to getting tangled up in fishing gear or when predators are after them. Rough time. So uh, I think we have another video question coming in. Coming in, huh? Why does the sea turtle ash out of the egg? Then why does it swim all by itself with no mom and dad? <laughs> this might sound like the parents are, are a little bit lazy, but <laughs> the, okay, so the male sea turtles or leatherbacks, especially, or I think all sea turtles, but definitely the leatherbacks, the males don't actually come ashore ever. After they hatch, they go in the water and that is it. That's where they stay. And then females, of course, come to lay their eggs uh, on the beaches and it makes them really, really tired. You can imagine that's a lot of energy to pop out 115 eggs. Um, so they do need to return back to the water because it would be like almost two full months that they would be sitting there on the beach waiting for their babies to hatch. So they go back in the water and kind of replenish their resources. But the great thing is that when a turtle hatches, they have all of the other hatchlings there as well. So you might have seen some imagery of like a bunch of small baby turtles going to the ocean. So at least they have each other after they hatch. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Okay. So it looks like there's a couple of questions here in the chat. Chelsea, have you gotten a chance to see them? Uh, comments. Okay. Um, okay. Sexual maturity, I think I saw come up a couple times. So how long mm -hmm. does it take for a sea turtle to reach sexual maturity? It depends on species, but it's typically between, well, like there's some ranges that are like between 12 and 30 years, but it's typically between like 20 and 30 years for sexual maturation of sea turtles. Awesome. I just saw Susan Fudge come on. Hi, Susan. She's done lots of great work for us in Newfoundland, Labrador. Hello. <laughs> and hi to Sarah and Lee as well and Rebecca. Oh, there's so many. I didn't flick over to the comment section, but I just see everyone hopping on here. That's awesome. That's great. Okay. Um, so I think that covers it. And Lee Parks said she really appreciated the closed caption being shown because they are deaf. And that's really great. Glad that our videos can be inclusive for you. If Amazing. We, I think we'll just take one last look. If there's no other questions, um, you can always send them to us in the chat. We'll get back to you later. I think it's time for us to transition to some trivia. So that will be our chance 
for those of us who are in the audience to show what they've learned and it's super fun. Um, so we're gonna transition over to trivia and just type your answers in the chat and there might be a slight delay. So, you know, um, if we don't see it right away, that's why. Um, and uh, really excited to see what you have learned. Okay, so here comes our trivia, and I think our first question. So if a nesting site is warmer, are you likely to see more female or male hatchlings? Let's see in the chat. And a 50-50 chance. So if you get yeah. it wrong the first time, keep guessing. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Let's see. Hard to give it away. I see females Ooh, coming Females in. from Diana. Awesome. Oh, and in the interim, there's a there's a question that came up. Maybe we can address that later. Oh, more females. Rebecca, thank you. Forest seems to be a trend. Females, Susan, females. You're right. The answer is females. Female. Awesome. You guys oh, were really? great. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> awesome job. Awesome. That's great. And I can see there that WWF has also listed a link in the chat. So if you want to host a small household cleanup and try and get that dirt off the beach. Awesome. Oh, here's our next one. How much can a leatherback sea turtle weigh? Now remember, these are the biggest ones. We know that they are eight up to eight feet in length, but how heavy are they? Yeah, how heavy would something that big be? I'm sure the shell really contributes to the weight. Although, <laughs> I don't know if they count the shell. I guess they would because they can't take it off. <laughs> <laughs> no, they can't take it off. I wouldn't recommend. <laughs> if they're like me, they'd want to take their shell off or maybe add it on or just play around with it a little bit. All right. I see that Sigrid also was right and Kaylee was right on the last one. Over 2,000 okay. pounds. 2,000 pounds. Okay. So I can see some people did make guesses, but I didn't see them until the end. 300 and 600. Those numbers don't stick in my mind either. So a really big turtle. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. right. Some are coming in. Kaylee, guess. All right. How do the sea turtles find their direction over their long migrations? A Finding Nemo moment for y'all. <laughs> yeah, and there might be a couple answers to this the way you want to phrase it, but um, I think it's one of the most cool attributes of sea turtles. Yeah, definitely. No spoilers, though. No spoilers. <laughs> okay, we've got a built-in GPS. We've got magnetic field. I wonder if that's right. Sounds, sounds mm -hmm. right. I should be quizzing you too, Victoria. <laughs> Making sure you're paying attention. <laughs> well, <laughs> looks yeah. like using electromagnetic fields. That was right. That's right. Mm -hmm. So whether you said magnetic bits in their brain or the magnetic <laughs> fields on the earth, those things are definitely intertwined. Awesome, awesome job, you guys. Really great. Something metal in their brain. I like that, Kaylee. Awesome. <laughs> Okay, how many species of sea turtles are threatened to some degree? Oh my gosh, I don't remember this one. I'm going to be just as surprised. <laughs> we talked about seven different ones and four in Canada. Mm -hmm. and I wonder if you guys can remember how many are threatened to some degree. Hmm. Really quick, I just wanted to answer a question I saw come in about how long sea turtles live. They become mature after about 20 to 30 years, and then they usually reproduce for another 10 years after that. So it kind of varies a little bit, I'd say between 30 and 40 years, depending on the species. Okay, we've got some answers. We've got Doreen yeah. at four. Justin says all of them. All of them, sad face. Forrest says 20. 20. Forrest, there's only seven. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, it was all of them. That's why the number didn't stick in my brain. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. not good. Too many. Too many is right. Yeah. <laughs> well, we won't end our show on that note. I think that's all of the trivia today. So thank you everybody for participating and guessing. Um, I guess 
all I can do right now is thank you guys so much for tuning in uh, and let you know that on a positive note, you can do your own shoreline cleanup. We've got the link in there. Do it with your bubble. Sign up for Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup. The turtles will absolutely thank you. And join us next month on the next month on Wildlife Wednesday, which is the last Wednesday of every month at 3 p.m. EST. We're going to be joined by Rin Jin, who's going to talk to us about big cats. So he's our resident big cat expert. And I know that's a hot, exciting topic for a lot of people. So join us then. And uh, thank you so much, Chelsea, for joining us today. It was awesome. Thank you, Victoria. This was so much fun. I had a blast. Thank you. Okay. Well, goodbye, everyone. Happy Wildlife Wednesday.